Hi everyone, that was a little low in, slow in starting there. Good afternoon, hope everybody's well and thank you for joining us today for our fourth webinar in the Recover and Rise series. We're going to be talking a little bit later on to Chris all about cyber security um, and how to stay safe online, which is really important when obviously you're running a business or trading online. And Chris has got some really good hints and tips um, and information for us on that. Before I start, I noticed that we've got a few new people in the room. So I'm just going to invite Nikita um, from Network My Club to just talk through the Remo platform that we're on. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's event. So just a couple of points to figure out Remo and get you familiar with the platform. So just to highlight when the Q&A starts later, there's a Q&A section just to the right of your screen. So you can put any questions in there. To turn your camera and microphone on, just use the toolbar along the bottom of the screen where it says cam on and mic on. In the open networking room, just double click the table and you'll move over there. Um, if you're having any problems turning your camera and microphone on, just give the screen a refresh and that should reload it. If you have any questions, any queries, just double click one of the help desks for support. And you can also use the button tile view in the toolbar to make everyone's um, screens just appear a bit larger on your screen as well. Any problems, just find me in the room. Thanks, Cheryl. Quite slow in pulling through from my little avatar, so I'm sorry about that today. Um, so as I say, this is our fourth in our series. I'm just going to share slides, um, if I may, quickly and show you all what we're up to. Um, can everybody see those? Let's just get those into present presentation mode. OK, so Recover and Rise, we are series one, getting online, all about how to get online, how to improve your business online, how to sell online, how to be secure online. Um, that's what we're all about for the next few weeks. All of the workshops start at midday. They're all lunchtime and they're all Tuesdays and Thursdays. We then go through the series two, which is about customers and marketing, series three, systems and productivity and series four, growth and expansion. So, as I say, today we're talking about web security, but on Thursday, we're going to be running a webinar on e-commerce with Malcolm Duffett, who some of you might have met a few times. He's also one of our digital champions. And Malcolm's going to be running through how you can sell online using different systems and different platforms, what it looks like and how you can actually improve your business and make sure that you can get those all important sales. So that's on Thursday. So if you haven't booked onto that yet, book onto that and come along. That would be really great. Um, but today we're going to hear from Chris White, who is police detective inspector. And um, Chris is going to talk to us all about why cybersecurity is important and how to protect ourselves and also how, what to do if we think something's not right. Um, because sometimes it's really difficult to know whether something's right or you know, not right and, and, and whether you've just got a feeling about it. So without further ado, I will hand over to Chris and uh, we can start that webinar. Chris, are you there? If you just pop your cam and your mic on, you should pop up on the screen with me. Hopefully I'm on. Yeah, there you go. Oh. Work in my end, but um, oh. let's just ref Right, hang on. If you if you're down if you look at the bottom of your screen chris you should be able to pop your cam and your mic on sorry about this everybody i'm just going to pop back out out of presentation mode so we can sort chris's camera oh he's just popped our screen he's just joined us back in the room now so he should okay. just turn his camera and microphone on right now go. brilliant hopefully that's all working uh, you just love tech yeah <laughs> That's frustrating because we were just talking, weren't we? So, do, do, do. right there we go. We can see. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Right. We can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Uh, we're trying. To, it's never a good cybersecurity input. It doesn't go wrong with the technology, so we have to live with that one. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Chris. Chris, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you. No problems. So, Chris White, I'm a police officer in um, the Southeast Cyber Resilience Centre, which uh, we're a not-for-profit organisation pulled together by private sector, public sector. Um, 
as it says there that we are working Thames Valley. Oxfordshire, Berkshire, Berkshire, West Sussex, Hampshire, Nile White. I will forces, sorry, Hampshire, Thames Valley, and Sussex. And what I've done is I've interviewed a lot of students from the local universities over at Portsmouth, Southampton, Surrey, Oxford, and New Bucks. Um, effectively, they're either the students are either doing um, computer science or cybercrime degrees, and to help make safer and trading online safer with their computer systems. So, going on to uh, the presentation at the moment, I'm going to talk to you about crime figures just to start off with. Um, roughly, these are all similar. UK. So in, in the southeast, southeast, we're no different with the threat landscape because the moment you plug your computer into the internet, you're game on for threat. Sadly, that anyone can experience all around the globe. globe. So, so when we look at the that. the overall levels of cybercrime reporting, it has remained consistent. Year, with a small exception um, in November, November, which was the likelihood line to buy stuff just before that mad Christmas rush. Um, I'd say, say that small little peak is. And businesses experience a little peak. It's still out there. The threat's still out there, sadly, in relation to computers. There is a national trend, which the southeast of the, the UK, so I can only narrow down some of the crime figures for Surrey, Sussex, Hampshire, and Thames Valley. But the national trend has seen cybercrime by about 11%. Um, the southeast has seen an increase back last June. Um, but we don't quite know what the big causation was for that. We break down some of the crime figures even more. When we look at the last quarter for this year, I'll go through some of these titles. So if you don't know what they mean, don't worry, I am going to explain them. But these, I'm going to be talking about these crime types because these are the more serious ones that we see at the moment. So email compromise that's effectively i don't know if you've got a yahoo account someone could guess your password log into your yahoo account and then um take over the account change the password and kick you out and that would be a proper headache for you network intrusion so i don't know if you own a, a baker's on the street corner and effectively you have a website and some infrastructure where you can book orders or you can take payments using an online system I could effectively break into your systems and then change your website around, just cause general havoc and lock you out. So that's where someone can get into your system and damage or disrupt your system. DDoSing, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service. That's where I could flood your website or your business with so much traffic that your website falls over. And a good example of that is when um, like big shows, musicians or football matches go on sale. Ticketmaster is a great example. Everyone wants a ticket at nine o'clock, and then by 9.03, um, the website's gone down because too many people are on it. That's DDoSing. Ransomware. So again, I've got into your system. I take a copy of your data. Um, I then encrypt what is left, and then you can't have access to any of your data. So I say like pension, customer record management database, emails. You just, you just lose access to everything, sadly, and that's called ransomware. And what happens next is you'll receive one email from me saying, um, if you want access to your, pay me some money. Um, and then if you pay, you then may get another, another email, email saying, here's your data back, but actually I want another payment to prevent me from publishing it online. So they're doing the what's called exfiltration, take, taking a copy of the data, encrypting it, and then exposing the data. So watch out for that one. PBX hacking, smaller figures there, only one last quarter. So PBX hacking is uh, sometimes you use online phone systems. Um, sometimes we pick up the phone and we just dial the number. But when we're at work in bigger organizations, we use the internet to make those phone calls. With some of those internet phone systems can be hacked as well. And we see, what do we see there? Um, premium rate numbers being dialed. And you wouldn't know until the phone bill come in. Um, web vulnerabilities, small figures again there put that down to minor vulnerabilities and exploits in websites where they just exploit the issues. But more importantly, moving on to data breach. So that's where someone's stolen your data and you've lost part of your data. And then it could be a, a reportable incident off to the information commissioner's office. And then the other one, a baseless extortion threat. Um, there could be, I, I DDoS your company until you pay me to stop. 
Um, that's some I've seen there. We've talked about ransomware. Ransomware still remains to be the primary disruptive threat to organizations in Southeast England. And we're, we'll show you later on how that can happen. So down in the Southeast, we've had um, over the previous quarter, there are about 19 ransomware incidents involving small businesses. Um, and then there was four ransomware incidents that um, effectively disrupted people at home because you can still catch this stuff at home. We know that um, in a lot of the incidents, um, the dominant variant is ransomware called Conti. Um, certainly different ransomwares have different titles because um, they're different pieces of software or they're different organized crime groups groups operating it. But um, ransomware did get a bit busy during the summer. Um, historically, there was a ransomware outfit called Darkside um, and they were responsible for that incident over in America. You might have heard of it, that colonial pipeline attack. They did go quite um, but I know that they offer this as a service so you can go onto the internet there are particular areas of the internet where you can buy someone or you can buy something that can undertake this service for you if you're not technically competent to do it yourself but that's known as ransomware as a service so there's not a lot you can't buy on the internet and you can still unfortunately buy unlawful um, products and unlawful services so you can get people to do this um, and they run things like price jobs or hourly rates or daily rates, this stuff, sadly. So we break down the victims um, as to who's being targeted. I mean, I could be safe to say that um, once your computer is connected to the internet, you could be exposed to all manner of these threats. Um, but looking at this, manufacturing seems to be impacted on the most. Um, and then going around that circle, professional scientific, that's probably some link to pharmaceutical sector at the moment. But yeah, have a quick look at that. These are all in relation to the more serious cyber instance. Um, there is a vulnerability out there that you might have heard of, and I don't want to go too technical in this group, but it's called Print Nightmare, which um, if you have printer scanner copiers in your workplace, the, sh the short version is if you could make sure that they all get their software updates when there's weaknesses and vulnerabilities, effectively that would be fixed overnight as long as you're updating all of your de devices your machines your mobile phones we're going through the threats because this we can relate to a little bit more so it's all color coordinated what we'll probably look at here is business because i think we'll chat today but we do targeted threats towards primary schools and secondary schools and further education colleges. So overwhelmingly at the top there, you can see the threats are all coming in through phishing emails, phishing attacks. Then the next one down is impersonating crime. So again, that could be a phishing email where I'm just pretending to be someone I'm not, um, which is there, but you should always, if you're not too sure about an email, don't be too afraid to react and act on what they're, they're asking you to do. Do your due diligence, go to a reputable search engine Check out the company's details and phone them on their advertised phone number. You should never phone someone on the phone number which they send you in the same email that you've got suspicions about. Just take your time. Um, you don't need to rush. And if there's any emails where they're putting you on um, urgency, then that's a great red flag for me. If someone says you must do this within the next hour, that's a pretty much a red flag because that's not how genuine lawful people do trade. <clears throat> So once the, the phishing emails come in, um, sadly, some people click on the link, then the computer, by clicking on the link, has had the permission to download viruses or the malicious software. Viruses, your malicious software is, third, is the third biggest threat we see at the moment. Then you've got unauthorized access of files or networks by students. The denial of service attacks. So we're going down the list there, um, and you can just see where the threats are. So is the phishing emails the result of a cyber incident there's disruption it's not always a financial disruption so yes at the top there no any listed impact that's just some of the data which we've collated and that people haven't filled it in um so we've just always got to do full disclosure on that data so we just don't it's an unknown listed impact but what you'll see there is people in business you your time's taken out of your day to recover from the impact or disruption of that incident. And time is money, isn't it, realistically? When your staff are not able to deliver the product or service that you sell, 
and they're trying to do something else. Time is money. So you may get bad reputation, loss of sales. People might go to your competitors. Um, you get complaints. You then might have to cover off fines or goodwill compensation. So it's not just a cyber incident where your computers won't work. There's a lot of consequences to that. Can we stop all this from happening in the first place? So I mentioned earlier about um, the, what are the easiest ways majority of cyber attacks is covering off um, some of these up-to-date malware web protection. So if you're running a Windows 10 machine or Apple machine or Mac, um, the security settings, just make sure Windows Defender is up-to-date, turned on, and actively downloading its latest protection every day. So always make sure you're getting the download. If you're using a paid for virus product or a free virus product, just make sure it has the ability to make contact with the internet every day and download today's version of it. Passwords, definitely important. We've got to have strong passwords. I'd probably move away from that expression of passwords and go to passphrases. So just wrap three random words together. They can't be linked into um, like pet names, birthplaces, favorite color, or maiden names. All of those are out realistically. Um, maiden names, because I could probably go on to, um, what's that website? Ancestry.com. And I can look up a lot of your maiden names anyway, because it's all there listed publicly. So certainly on social media accounts, we do leak a little bit too much information on social media accounts, especially when it comes to pets. Um, so three random words. Just pick three random words, squash them together, and then make that your new passphrase. So try and get it out of your head, password. Go to a passphrase. Um, it'd be nice if you could have a passphrase with character length of at least 13 characters. So if I put that into context, the password in your head, um, and you have a password length, which is only made up of eight characters. Um, I could probably hack a password that's only eight characters long in just under 20 minutes. So we, we've got to do better with our passphrases. So try to get your passwords a little bit longer than 13 characters would be pretty good. I know your sh oh, computer's getting fast. If we could just make our passwords longer. Firewalls, we need firewalls turned on. So at home, you're probably looking over nearby the TV and you've got your Sky Router, your Talk Talk Box or your BT Home Hub. And then I know in small business, you like to have those same sort of devices. Just make sure the firewall's turned on and it's working. Um, so that will keep the bad traffic out and the good traffic in. It's rather like you're going into, a, I guess, a nightclub and you've got the door steward on the door. Generally, they screen or vet their customers, don't they? And a firewall will be screening internet traffic and it will be preventing the bad stuff getting in and out. Um, restricting rights. So again, if you're a small business, um, your laptops, which you're using, or your computers that you're using, make sure you're not using it on the administrator account. So I know when you take the laptop out of the box, you plug it in, and it has one account which you log into. That's usually the administrator account where you've got permission to do loads of different things. What you need to do is create a guest account, or try not to call it a guest account, but call it in your personal name. But just make sure you have standard user settings, so not administrator level. Administrator means that you can do anything. You can do untold amount of damage. So realistically, we want to remove administrator settings and do your day-to-day -day business activity. So surfing the net, answering emails, just do it on a standard account that doesn't have high level of privileges. Why? I open up an email, I click on the link. Um, I then try to download some software with only standard privileges. I can't download the software. So that means I can't download the virus. So there's good protection there. Um, backing up data. So we must have a backup. It is, um, I know people are comfortable with using the cloud. Um, certainly, we've got Dropbox, iCloud, OneDrive. They're all good examples of it. You must make sure that you have backups in place. You can use cloud, or if you've got your own um, storage devices in your shops or offices, once you've completed your backup, it needs to be unplugged from the internet. So it's called an offline backup. So if you leave your backups all connected to the internet, if the virus comes in, it will find your primary backup and then it will realize that you've got another backup connected and it will just encrypt that as well. But if you unplug your backup when you're not using it, no one can get to it. So just make sure you have offline backups. So as we go down that list, there's certain security controls which we can put on. Um, policy so you must have a policy to update any security updates within 14 days sounds complicated but just go into your windows setting or your mac settings and just turn 
automatic updates on. You can do that on your iPhones and your Android phones as well. Just turn software updates and app updates to automatically on. Some phones are set up so that um, they will only do the updates when they're plugged in on charge and they're on their home Wi-Fi and they have more than 51% of battery life left. So just bear in mind that um, when you charge your phone up, that's when probably it has its only opportunity to do those updates. And then if you're going out shopping, I don't know, um, or you're on the train and you're going to connect to any public Wi-Fi, it's preferable that you use what's called a VPN, a virtual private. Um, the ability where you can encrypt your so why if i'm on the same network on the public wi-fi with some special software i can see um internet traffic and i can decrypt it um and i can see that i don't know if you had a yahoo account or you were logging into ebay you log into ebay and it says what account do you want to use you type in normally your email address it then says what's your password you type in your password well with some software you can see all that traffic being transmitted and received but if you have a virtual private network a vpn turned on that gives you end-to-end -end encryption. So if you can use public Wi-Fi to do what's called sensitive searching, so that's like your banking, your emails, anywhere where you've got to log in and pass a password, preferably use a virtual private network. If you're just going to log in to see the latest sports results or see what the weather's like, that's not sensitive. But I would prefer if you used a virtual private network. So we're going to fish in emails because that's what is at the moment. Whether you're on your phone or on your phone, you're going to get a screen like this. The email comes in. So this is rather old one, but um, things don't change with the phishing emails. So there's a couple of things here. Let's, we, uh, let's go for the chat room then. Let's use the chat room. Let's. Um, there's five things wrong with this email or five red flags on this email, which would make straight away. Can you type in, if any of you can spot, what's the risk in this email? we go through and identify them. So anyone see anything wrong with this email? Any alarming features? So certainly on your computer, you can probably see the mouse. You can highlight the mouse up the top. So the time date stamp. So how many of you have had United Parcel Service come round your house at 4.49 in the morning? It just doesn't happen. So have a look at the time date stamp. Does it match the sort of service that's been delivered? So to me, I'd delete that straight away. If they were around my house at 4.49 in the morning, I probably would have heard about it because there'd be doorbells going. Um, the email address. You know you can hover across the email address and it will tell you the real email address behind it. So we'll go through that in a second. So time date stamp, the email address. So when we hover across it, it would display the real find it. So we know there the ntxresearch.com is nothing to do with UPS. So as long as you hover across it, or if you're using a mobile phone, blue, you press it, it will show you the real email address it's come from. So always check the header. If you're in a business and you've got things like Office 365 running, there is a rule you can put in where it will automatically display the real email address for you. But you just got to confirm to do that for you. Have a small business big enough to um, have a couple of um, staff members, you can configure it to make life easier for you. So consider that one. So attachments, download. I wouldn't download anything that I don't really expect. So a zip file is quite dangerous. Um, so you download the zip file, it's a bit of software, it will go onto your computer, you double which is then on your machine. So Consider what you really need to download. So any Microsoft Office products, you can use what's called disabled macros or open in protected view. If you don't really need to open up the whole spreadsheet or the PowerPoint, always make sure any Microsoft products, you can open them up in protected view only. Why? Because you can hide a virus in a spreadsheet or you can hide a virus in a Word document. It's, it, it's not complicated to do that which is why you always see things like macros disabled. It's quite important to leave them disabled. Um, dear customer, again, it's a little bit vague, isn't it? Realistically, if it's a personal email, it should say dear Chris. So anything that's dear customer, they don't know who you are, so delete that. And then the comma, there's a little bit of grammar error in there as well. Yes, I know the bad guys are getting better at their literature and grammar, and there's less errors in it, but certainly that one is a dead game. For example, Barclay card. How many errors on this one? One, two, three, four, 
I'm, I can see five on that one. Any ideas on that one? So again, the email address at the top, hover across that one. So there's the real, real email address underneath it. Again, you can see that Barclay cards server.cybermarket24.ru. Certainly, last time I checked, .ru means Russia. Barclay card head office is not based in Russia. So again, straight delete. You've got a cut and paste error here, haven't you? Between party and this, that should all be on the same line. Get started. If you hover across that, that will not be taking you to the Barclay Card website. That'd be going somewhere else. And then down the bottom there, I have done this talk to education. And they said best regards. That should be a capital R on the second word, which is a bit serious. But Barclay Credit Card, they never call themselves that, do they? It's always Barclay Card. So a bit of break. Anyone not had this? An email. I know it's curiosity killed the cat, and we're all wishing to just click on the link just to see what it happens. Um, well, I can just tell you, it takes you. If you're in the UK, it will take you to um, a SPIF TV license. Basically, all it's trying to do is just get money out of you. But again, if you're outside of the UK, because this is a campaign that's targeting UK people only, if you open this email up outside of the UK, it takes you to some weird YouTube channel. So. There's something called your IP address, which gives away which country you're in. So that's how people target particular countries with phishing emails. So, yeah, from email up there, insightbase.com is not the UK TV licensing outfit. I say outfit, sorry, agency. <laughs> what happens? You click on the link and it takes you to a dodgy website. So you go onto this. Remember, so we've clicked on the obituaries section. And you see the circle is going round and round at the moment. Often seen when you've got a slow internet connection. Um, you, oh, it's a bit slow website or my internet's playing up. At the top, you see it responding. Um, down the bottom now, you see security center. That's been turned off. That would be worrying. But unfortunately, it's now too late. So you're probably thinking, oh, this is a very slow website. You might close the screen. You might not. You might just sit and wait. But what we into that? That was 26 seconds. I think that was. That is the encryption has taken place. All of your files are now encrypted. You can't see anything. Everything's like gobbledygook, as you can see there. That is how quick the encryption takes place. So there's a lot of things you can do to prevent that from happening, and we will go through that. But um, roughly, that is what you see and how quick it takes place. So the only file which we left unencrypted, this is a typical example, this is the only file you can see. So there will be all your files have been encrypted, tough luck, not a lot you can do, don't reset, don't do this, don't do that. A lot of worrying things there. Email address here. So this will be the email. If you want your stuff back, you email us and you put some money in our Bitcoin wallet. So they will say how much money they want um, and effectively... Bitcoin is a, it's a currency. It goes up and down like a YOLO, like, like any other currency. But certainly they could ask for one Bitcoin or half a Bitcoin. I, I have heard that they do homework on the businesses that they do target once they successfully target them. So they would go into company's house and they would see how much money you've got roughly from your last submitted accounts. And then they will adjust their ransom accordingly. So certainly... Um, Let's look at the figures. Since last March, so March 2020 to July 2021, we saw 294 reports of um, ransomware reported to action fraud. 46 of those were schools. Um, so it is quite disruptive to schools, and they do tend to target schools during school holiday time when there's not many IT support people in. So again, we've also seen examples of um, some of these ransomware um inflicting their damage on like long bank holiday weekends because they know there's less people in offices or shops because most of them are shut because it's a bank holiday so just be aware of that we we'll protect ourselves because it yep. all sounds a bit doom and gloom at the moment doesn't it so what we want is to go to say whether or not you're at home um on the family computer or whether or not you're at work all advice is this systems if you're on windows 10 just make sure it's auto updating it's so, a switch that is inside the window settings just turn on auto updating and on your phones update the apps 
mobilities are found, the manufacturers of these devices fix it. And this stuff happens 24 seven um, because it's not necessarily the people that are fixing it are in the same country. So they could be working whilst we're sleeping. So yeah, effectively update your systems, update your browser, update your antivirus, your anti-spyware. So on Windows, that's called Windows Defender. So antivirus and anti-spyware is all in the same one, but you might have downloaded some additional ones. Make sure your firewall is updating. So you can see the theme here, make sure everything is auto updating. There's something called two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. Again, turn it on, yeah, they're free. So they all have it. Um, just turn it on. So if I log into my email account and it's the first time I've used that device to log in, effectively, it will send you like a six digit code to your phone as a text message, or you might have an authenticator app. And then you type that six digit number in and then. It... So make sure two-factor authentication is turned on. When it is turned on, you and see from, I don't know, Sainsbury saying, here is your six digit authenticator text. You've been in bed, you know you've been asleep. So someone knows your password to your Sainsbury's account. So effectively, you know that password is compromised. They couldn't get any further because they didn't type in that six digit code that went to your phone. But it's a great notification to say, ah, my password's been compromised. I need to change that. But without two if they turned on, you can just imagine what's happened. So I see that quite a lot. Every week I speak to businesses where they, small business do all their trading on and Facebook and Instagram. So not all of them have turned 2FA on on Facebook and Instagram. So if there's a data breach and I can see some passwords for that small business, you could log into their Instagram account, take over their account, change their password, be a bit disruptive, probably damage the reputation, upset some customers. In the meantime, you'll email the business. If you want your Instagram account back, um, you best pay me some money. Quite rightly, you'll be reporting it to Instagram, who then respond and do the investigation and try and give you back to your genuine account. But that doesn't take place instantly. And whilst I have seen that side people social media accounts and they're just damaging your database. So just make sure you, um, again, virtual private network, if you're going to use anything other than a trusted Wi-Fi, so you're going to go to a Wi-Fi that you don't know who owns. Password manager. So if you've got access to a password manager, they're on your browser, or you can download a password manager, definitely use one. So the password can store all your passwords for you, so you only really need to remember one long, strong one, which gives you access to your password manager. And a password manager will then remember all of your other passwords for all of the yeah. other um, accounts that you log into. So I think I've got, um, I don't know, it's well over 100. Um, and it still mounts up, doesn't it? You've got your, your bank, your shops, your loyalty schemes, your email, Amazon, Facebook, it all adds up. So there's probably, I guess most people had at least 40 to 50 passwords. So have a password manager with that. I know in the olden days people use post-it notes, um, but we're trying to move across to password managers now. A screen lock. So on using it, um, effectively, it should go into space, and then when you come to you pick it up and you come to use it, on phones, they would take your face, facial recognition. Others would take your fingerprint. Others would get a password or a pin code or even a pattern. Just make sure you've got that turned on. So that if someone picks up your phone, they have to keep their kids out of their phone. I know that. Um, but certainly just make sure you've got screen lock on. And you should have a separate account for every user as well when you're at work. So if 10 people are logging into the same generic computer, you can't tell what's gone wrong. So have a separate account for each user. And again, backing up and not using uh, public Wi-Fi. So I've talked about some of the risks. Um, and. I know some of you that that might be above you. Some of you might be technically proficient and this already, but certainly the the Home Office when they started this project, they realised that um, not all small business have the technical or support to find help. And then when they have looked, they can't all um, access that help because it's on. So effectively, we're offering um, these services here. No services here. So security training, for instance, and the info says that new staff when they join a business should have some security within one month of joining a company. 
comply with some of their recommendations. But I know small business don't have departments. So it's something which we can offer as well. Just general security awareness training. And it will benefit you as well because we've all got savings accounts and mortgages, which we want to keep our money because we've worked hard to get it. Most of the, all of the cybersecurity training which we do does benefit you as a person, not just uh, as an employee or workforce. Um, if we go down that list, because some of them have got confusing titles, but the remote vulnerability assessment, I can pretend to be a hacker, look at your systems from the outside looking in, and I can see what the weaknesses and vulnerabilities are. We would then provide you a report, the low hanging fruit yourself, um, and then if it's out of your technical capability, we can signpost you to some more experts that can help fix your systems. We provide that all in a report, and the hackers will obviously, once they find a vulnerability, they would exploit it. Um, the internal in this one is once they get into your systems, they can see how they can move around your system. So imagine that you're big enough that you've got quite a few staff. Some of those staff, um, well, one of them could be a bad apple, a midlife crisis. What could they do with the data? They could go into your sales database or your pension database and just take a copy of everything and then try and sell it on the dark web. So your sales team shouldn't have access to your HR data and your um, I know that the security guard shouldn't have access to the sales data. It, you give people what's called least privileged principles. They only get what they need to do to undertake their roles. Um, security policy reviews. Again, do you have security policies in place? Do people know what to do? What is the plan? Um, not everybody has any security policy reviews. And again, continuity exercise. Have you practiced a cyber drill? So I know that we've looked at, um, we have fire drills, haven't we, since the day we were in school, and we do first aid training four times a year, but one of the new threats at the moment is, uh, have we ever practiced a cyber drill? Do all your staff know what to do if it starts to go wrong? So we do continuity exercise planning and training. So that um, covers that off. Cyber Essentials is a framework which the UK government are pushing out. So you know where you've got some, um, you want to install some windows um, or you want to buy a certain toy. They've all got frameworks and they, so like British Kite Mark or ISO. Well, Cyber Essentials is um, what we are doing as a benchmark framework for computers. So if you achieve Cyber Essentials, yes, there's a cost to it. It's £300 plus fat, but it will encourage you to do certain cybersecurity devices so i talk about your computers your laptops and um your mobile phones so say mobile phones, but they are effectively just small computers that fit in your pocket if you get cyber essentials and you achieve it that will protect you from the cyber crime you're also entitled to cyber insurance as part of that scheme um, so that's something worth considering because I know some people go and buy cyber insurance and uh, I certainly we pushed a school down this journey the other day and yes cyber essentials cost them the 300 pound plus fat to get that achieved they didn't need to do um their cyber insurance which was costing them about 2000 pound a year so have a look at cyber essentials give us a ring we can help you along that journey um certainly join the cyber resilience center it the, the core membership is free of charge everyone gets a welcome pack um, which talks to you about what we can do there's monthly newsletters that come out that um talk you through what the, the threat is that we're seeing um so every week i get to see the crime data and i see that there could be facebook account takeovers instagram account takeovers um people logging into um, work machines when they're at home, people letting their kids jump on their laptops to do their homework. The kid goes on to a weird web and then sadly downloads the virus to your work machine, which then spreads around. So some of these are like bad practices, but I can see why sometimes this happens. But the membership, we're, we're talking you through some of the things that you can fix yourself for a charge. There's a lot of free services out there that the government are dishing out which others charge for but certainly there's some things that you can download for yourself that you use in the workplace that will help keep you safe not as a chargeable service so they see it secrc.co.uk slash membership if you just join sign up have a read of the welcome pack and then one of us will be in touch with you to have a chat through what you need but if you want to connect on um, linkedin my details are there 
Um, we are on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Spotify, Buzzsprout. The list goes on because I know everyone is not comfortable with um, every single channel. So we're just trying to get out there and raise awareness realistically. And it is just generally crime prevention advice, but we're now moving on to this cyber crime prevention advice because that's just what we do as the police. So question time, I guess. Yes, please, Chris. That was absolutely brilliant. Really, really interesting, actually. Um, we've got absolutely loads of questions, and um, I'm going to sit and ask your avatar. Oh, I can see you. Oh, hello. Can you see us? We can see you. Chris. We can see you. I don't know right, I'm back. Can. Great, brilliant. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> I didn't realize I didn't know then whether you could see that we could see you so that could have been awkward um we've got quite a few questions here you can can you see the Q&A from your screen? gotcha yeah I don't know whether you can run down them or whether you know there's quite a few there so perhaps you could just kind of run down and see what All right how many small businesses are affected on a yearly basis oh my lord um loads <laughs> <laughs> loads so i will get some actual data for you on that one okay. i will um i'll get some data and i'll put that um back to cheryl so she can send you an update um on that one but i'll get you the i can break it down by sussex surrey thames valley and hampshire area depending on where you are i think you're all in sussex but I'll, i can find out organizational data for you so if you don't mind i would pass on that one at the moment but i will get you the answer I think so you get the great. correct data. I think from, from my personal perspective, when you think about hacking and cybersecurity, you always think about the large companies. You don't actually think about the small businesses. So it would be actually really good to see to see that sort of data so we know how vulnerable we are as a small business community. So, yeah, thank you. That would be really nice. Okay, question number two. Um, I don't have offline backup, which I'm thinking would be so nice. Right, Google and Dropbox, they're, they're one of many of the, the backup solution providers. So if I'm sat on my computer now and I have all of my family photos on my computer and then I back them up to iCloud or Dropbox, there is a backup there. So say, for instance, the hacker gets into my computer and he, I can get away with saying this, a he, because I haven't met a female hacker yet, um, but they delete all of the photos on my computer now that I'm using. They will see that there's a live connection to iCloud and they will then jump across to iCloud and they delete all of the photos on there as well. So now, yes, I know, say your computer had a hardware failure, you still got the iCloud as your backup, but if it's a malicious actor that gets in, they will see where your storage devices are, whether it's in the cloud or whether it's on a device, and they will delete the lot. There is certainly, depending on which company you use, they can do restore or rollback. Um, but if that hacker knows that, and then they go and do the simple thing like empty the waste bin, it's gone. So that's where the risk is. So the cloud solutions do provide solutions for power cuts and hardware failures, laptop failures. But when a malicious actor gets in there, they, they want your data, they want to prevent you from getting the data. So they're looking for you to pay to get their data back. So that's why you need an offline backup, which is like the, the luxury version. But I know that not everyone can afford that. There was another um, question there, actually, Chris, just leads on from there. How often should you back up? Can well, we God, yeah. Uh, How long's a piece of string, I'm sure. But Well, it depends how busy your business is. Because if you're, um, I don't know, let's pick on bakers this week. <laughs> Say, for instance, they start trading at 8 o'clock in the morning and they take a load of customer orders over the phone or online orders and you've taken 20 orders by 10 o'clock. Um, you lose your systems and that's 20 orders that you now need to try and find out who they were from, how they were paid, where they should be delivered to. It depends on how busy you are. So banks, they would do what's called mirroring backup about three or four times a second. Um, quite obvious why they do that and they'll be stored in multiple different locations all around the world um, schools i think they do backups um, a little bit more frequently during exam time um, but if you're not a busy business you might want to do weekly backups or daily backups certainly at home i think i do monthly backups but it depends how busy you are and again finances because to do a backup 
um, could be costly because you're increasing your storage space. So it's how much time you've got um, to work out if it all goes wrong to fix it. Um, we've got one from Clive here. Action fraud is dismantling what or who is replacing the service. That's work in progress. <laughs> um, so action fraud is still around. They are the UK's response to reporting cybercrime or economic crime or fraud. Um, it's run by the City of London Police Force and until a another service has been identified and is up and running and is fault free we won't be moving away from action fraud so they are here for the moment but um they're not going anywhere and i think that's all in tendering um at the moment so i don't know the answer to that one i don't think many people do know the answer to that one um is there an operating system which is less hackable uh well so microsoft windows is quite popular isn't it quite a lot of people around the world have it and Apple is probably one of the biggest competitors. Um, a lot of people have iPhones and iPads and MacBook Pros. Um, certainly Windows machines are more flexible from um, a configuration and programming point of view. And Apple's a little bit more locked down, isn't it? They, they work in containers whereby an app gets vetted and screened by Apple. And unless you tear down a, an Apple product, you can't really get inside of it. They do have um, weaknesses and vulnerabilities like anything. Um, they are massively different in the way they operate. Windows and Apple users don't get on, do they? Because they, they, even like the left mouse button and the right mouse button does completely weird things. Yes, there are people that do say Apple machines are, are far more um, secure. Um, but then there's other software out there called Kali Linux, which is not so user friendly, but that is more secure. Um, it, you've got to get what's right for you. And then like with all of the devices, the advice is the same in relation to turning on 2FA, which is not operating system specific. Turn on your antivirus, make sure it's updating, turn on the patching, make sure it's updating. All of these things keep all of the devices safe. And that also includes things like your Samsung TV at home, your smart TV. I mean, I know you might not think that those things can catch viruses, but they can because you can surf the Internet on them. And you'll find that um, in some of the Samsung TVs that, that it, there is an antivirus in there and a monthly checkup you should be doing on, in, on them as well, which is a scary thought, isn't it? But anything that's connected to the Internet, a smart device. I hear every day that you can hack um, different devices. So case study time. Um, the world's one of the casinos over in America um, last year publicized that they were the safest casino going. Brave, because they were hacked within a matter of hours just to prove a point. Um, how did they get done over? Well, in the casino lobby, there was a fish tank, which obviously had um, fish in it, fish temperature, fish pump, fish this, fish that. And the temperature gauge was connected to the Internet um, and it had a vulnerability in it. So they hacked the casino through the fish tank temperature gauge. Um, so you've, they're called Internet of Things. So when you look at your own house, I know there's a lot of washing machines out there that are now Internet enabled. There's toasters, kettles, fridge freezers, TVs. You've got the Amazon Alexa, the Google Echoes, the Ring doorbells, all of these things. We're desperate to connect everything to the Internet, but we're not too concerned about reading instructions on how to set it up correctly. So all I would say is... Um, Please do read the manufacturer's instructions. Make sure you've taken everything off of its default password because you can Google most default passwords. So like a printer scanner copy in the office, if it's still left on the password it got when it was put in its box and you take it out of the box and just plug it in, I could probably get into your printer scanner copier because it would be on its default password. So do read the instructions because they are all different. We are trying to challenge different manufacturers at the moment. So most of security products are a an opt-out if you're not happy with it, rather than you having to opt in to turn stuff on, because that would be the better way of operating some of these things securely. Um, let's go back to question time. You can see I talk, don't you? Is there free software I can use to check if I ordered? We can always carry it on in the networking afterwards, but please, you know, carry on for a moment or two. It's, it's, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. I can use to check if I or the team have been hacked. Does it become everything at war? Right. Is any um, particularly kind of, you know, something to share? So. The free software I can use to check that I or the team have been hacked. Um, I, can't, I don't understand the question in that one. Is it your device that's been hacked or whether or not you've been involved in a data breach? If um, you could just, just chuck that in the chat room. So have I been pwned? 
which is spelled P-W-N-E-D. Just use a reputable search engine and then type in at the top, have I been pwned.com. Um, should be a blue screen with white writing. If you register your email address on that, it will tell you how many data breaches you've been involved in and then tell you what the data is that um, has been breached. Normally, it's email addresses, password, name, address, um, employer's details. There's a lot of stuff which um, are, is out there on data breaches. Again, once you know what's been breached, you then know what to change. Um, if you've had quite a lot of like personal identifiable information breached, then you want to really be subscribed into like a free monthly credit scoring system. So Equifax, Experian, Moodle, any of those things, Clear Score, they can then give you um, a free monthly credit report. And if someone's doing what's called identity theft, pretending to be you, so I don't know, let's pick on Cheryl. <laughs> so I've got Cheryl's details, her date of birth, her home address, her postcode, her name. That's probably more than enough for me to get a mobile phone in her name. She can be kind enough and pay for it for me, and I'll get it delivered to my house. And then the next thing Cheryl will know, when the bailiff's knock on the door, saying, are you actually going to pay your phone bill? And you go, well, I know nothing about that. If you had your free monthly credit score, the moment I put a new mobile phone in your name, you'll see it. And then you can phone up whichever mobile phone provider it is and get it cancelled and squashed. Mm -hmm. Um, is there free software? <laughs> is there free software? I can check the team. We've done that one. Can't a password manager password be hacked? Yes, it can. So password manager companies, um, their business is to keep your data secure. If they do get hacked, then they're going to be bankrupt within seconds, aren't they? So they take security very seriously. And to access anything through a password manager, they will tell you, you have to have the latest operating system. You have to have two-factor turned on. You have to have a strong password. You have to use the same device. So they will make all of the security mandatory to use their services because they want to protect their brand as well because they're a business. And if you don't want to turn all that stuff on, then I doubt you'll be allowed to be a customer of theirs. So they take security seriously. But you are right. Yes, anyone that's on the Internet can be hacked. But they look after security far better than most people because of what they do. Um Action fraud, we covered that one off. Um, would we be able to have a slideshow sent to us after to look back on? Yep, I'll chuck that in a PDF for you. Scary to think the new TVs. Yes, totally agree. This one, have I been pwned? Correct, that's the one. Have I been pwned? What's that? So have I been pwned is basically a search engine of data breaches. So if you type your um, email address in, it's just searching against all of the data breaches that are out there. If it... If it comes back, if the screen goes green, I would say you haven't been involved in the data breach yet. <laughs> if the screen goes red, it will give you a list of the number of data breaches um, that you have been involved in. Now, certainly I've done some of these chats and my record is someone was involved in 34 data breaches. And the amount of information that was out there, the only way that they could clean it up was change all their passwords and move house. Now, that's not proportionate. Um, certainly what they needed to do was look through all of the breaches which involved a password and all you had to do was change the password for all of those breaches you can never use that password again because that's always now listed and saved against that email address so you change the password on those particular accounts and all of the other accounts where you've used the same password because your password is researchable and your email address is researchable but change the password turn on 2FA and never use that password again and if you're one of those people that does your password is like January 1, I know what your next password is going to be. So it's going to be January 2. So the hacker will know that as well. So if they see a password breach that involves January 1, for instance, and then when they try and log in, it's reset, they're just going to try January 2. So you need to do something when I spoke about three random words. So like beach, sun, sand. Make sure each word is capitalized. So from a password point of view, that's capital B, then E-A-C-H, capital S-U-N, capital S-A-N-D. That's what? Beach, B-E-A-C-H. 12. So that's 14 characters, isn't it? Beach, sun, sand. If you want to make your last character a space, that's quite annoying. It is a character. A space is a character, but then you can't actually see how long it is. You don't know how long it is. So... Chuck a space in at the end. That's Top a really tip. Good tip. Yeah, it's a really good tip. Yeah. And then if you are brave enough and good enough to make it complicated, putting symbols and numbers in, then that's where it starts to get difficult. 
Um, but three random words is quite good to start off with. The longer the words, and obviously pick ones that you can spell, otherwise that's going to be a bit annoying when you come back to <laughs> re enter it. But if you're not comfortable with using a password manager, I get that. Some people still like to use a little black book. Some people like to use post-it notes. Some people put the black book in a fireproof safe every night because they're comfortable with it because they're in real life possession of it. I use password managers myself. I have a long, complicated password, which gets me into it. The good thing about password managers as well is that if I go to eBay, um, for instance, and the password manager says, all oh, right, Chris is trying to get into eBay, it would then auto populate the password in eBay and then I log in and I've I've had to do very little human intervention. If I get an email in asking me to log into Amazon um, for today's deals, I go to Amazon, password manager is trying to populate the password, but it's already checked um, Amazon because it's a fraud website. I need to go to Amazon, but because the phishing email is directed me to go to their version of Amazon, the password manager will not populate with your password because it knows that's a fraud website. So it's doing some extra work in the background. So there are some pros and cons to it as well. But I know not everyone's comfortable with using something um, that they're not happy with. And I wouldn't encourage people to do anything they're not happy with. Okay. So have we been pwned? We covered that one off from that. Um, mine comes back with seven data breaches and one paste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have a look at the dates on those seven data breaches, Nat, and see... Um, Effectively, I don't know, if one was data breach in January 2016 to your Yahoo account, if you changed your password after January 2016, then you're safe. But if you're going, oh, I don't know whether I have, then I'd say that's a no, and you need to change your password. And at the same, same time, turn on 2FA. And then once you've done that, click the Verify Me button. So if there's a data breach tomorrow, you'll get automatic email notifying you saying you are involved in the, I don't know, the Chris White data breach. I hope not, but <laughs> you're involved in the Chris White data breach tomorrow um, and you'll get an email about it telling you what's gone and realistically how to fix it. All right. Um, -da -da, Vicky, what about cookies? When we have to accept these cookies, when we go onto websites, you don't have to accept cookies if you don't want to. Cookies are there to make life easier for you. So if you go onto the Marks and Spencer's website, the cookies is all about saving your history and you and what you've liked and where you've been before. So that when you jump onto the MS website, for instance, they know you looked up food um, last week. So the website will probably be offering you food offers on what you've been through before. So you can surf anonymously if you want to. Um, there's different websites out there. You get the warning every time you go onto a website these days to say accept all cookies or disable personalization cookies. You can disable all cookies if you want to, but you'll then just have to auto enter everything um, when you go, go onto that website. It just means a little bit more typing for you and you won't get that personalized experience, which is what the marketeers and advertising people think is great. Mm -hmm. Um, tracking cookies, cookie is a tracking thing. Uh, they're all tracking. Um, so you jump from one. So if you go to Google, for instance, you'll probably, there is some software that you can download off um, as an app. There's a like ghostery. So that will block all cookies um, and allow you to basically surf anonymously. Um, and you'll see that if you go onto like the BBC website or Google, that they might be exchanging cookie data between like 20 different companies because um, they all share data. So yeah, they track. Um, that's why you hit Google, don't you? And down the right-hand side, you get banners saying there's a plumber near you or there's a, an offer on at the bakery. That's how it all works. Um, but you can surf anonymously. Um, Ghostery or just set up your browser. So if you use Edge or Firefox, um, go into the settings and you can browse anonymously if you want to. Brilliant. Chris, you're an absolute superstar. Absolute superstar. Thank you so much. I'm getting a bit of an echo back, so I don't, I don't know if anybody else is. But, Chris, are you happy to stay around for sort of 10, 20 minutes um, on our networking session in case anybody's got any more questions for you? Yeah, certainly. I'll be around for a while, um, but definitely encourage you all to sign up to the centre and you can get that welcome pack come through um, and start that journey to keep you safer and trading online. Brilliant. And just to confirm, we will be sending out Chris's slides. So if you've missed any of the links or any of the info, we will be sending those out. So thank you, Chris. That's absolutely brilliant. We should see you in a moment. If you just right. turn your camera and mic off now, you'll disappear like magic from my screen. Thank you.
Okay, so just, that was absolutely, I mean, I was absolutely riveted there. I was really, really interesting, but so much information and so much to do. Um, as Chris has just said, he's going to hang around with us for a little while. We're going to have uh, about 20 minutes of networking. And for those of you um, who haven't used Remo before, you literally just, when we come out of presenter mode, you literally just click where you want to be. So you double click around the tables, depending who you want to talk to. Um, we don't have any digital champions today with us, but there is, I'll just quickly share my um, slide if I may, just to show you very, very quickly past Chris. We do have um, digital champions who we have um, introduced you to already, and you do get up to eight hours of free specialist support with these digital champions. Um, through Coaster Capital, and all you do need to do is register at that email address there. Um, you'll then have a chat with one of the Growth Relationship Associates. It is a free eight hours of support through this project, so I would really um, encourage you to take that up and also have a look at some of these um, business support areas that we've also discussed before. So the Hot House, where there's actually some grant funding at the moment, Low Case, um, the EU funding project, and Rise. Um, which is a knowledge exchange through the university. So some really, really good ways to actually maximise how you can get funding and how you can move forward. But I will pop off now and we will go into our networking session and um, click around, have a chat with Chris. We've got probably about just over 15 minutes. Thank you all so much for joining us and I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye now.